The Legend of Zelda Twilight Princess is widely regarded as having some of the best dungeons in the Zelda franchise. I'm here to take a closer look to find out why. So join me as I dive deeper into the murky depths of the forest dungeon in The Legend of Zelda Twilight Princess. This is the first dungeon in the game and so it makes sense that it kind of acts like a tutorial on how dungeons work, but Nintendo have cleverly designed it so it doesn't feel like a tutorial. It teaches the player by design rather than throwing the answers in the player's face like some of the more recent Zelda games. I'm looking at you Skyward Sword. This first room is a great example of that. The first enemy you encounter is a Deku Bubba. This enemy is rooted in place so it can't chase you. It's easily defeated with a few sword swings and you're rewarded with some ammunition for your slingshot. Close by is a climbable vine with some skull wall tulers just high enough that you might not see them. Upon climbing you'll get attacked and fall off. This prompts you to pull out your slingshot and take them out from the ground. At the far end of the room is a monkey in a cage. He's blocking you from your path, thus forcing you to free him from his wooden prison. How I didn't just chop his head off then, I'll never know. This is the first handholdy event in the dungeon where Midna states the obvious that the monkey is beckoning you to follow her. However, it does set the ground rules for the theme of this dungeon. You free the monkeys and they thank you by showing you where to go next. Let's take a moment to admire how gorgeous the art design in this dungeon is. It really feels like you're inside of a giant tree. Everything is made of wood and feels natural. There's moss on every surface and a thin fog in the air that really lends to the atmosphere. Here we have the first tough enemy of the dungeon. It's a disgusting big spider. But don't worry, it's easily defeated. They have a vulnerable spot under their belly. And by placing him at the top of the stairs, Nintendo have made it easy for you to defeat him. But that won't be the case later on in the dungeon. We won't have the advantage of being lower than them and being able to easily strike them from below. After defeating the Skulltula, there is a tantalising chest just out of reach. This is a foreshadowing of the item that we're going to get in this dungeon. It's something that lets us reach things that we couldn't before, and it makes us think about things in a different way. Which is useful for upcoming puzzles. Not only that, but the camera is angled in such a way here that we can see a secret passage below that we might be able to bomb through. But we don't have any bombs! But lucky for us, there is a bombling here. But when attacked, it will light its fuse before exploding in your face. The only way to gain access to the secret is to pick up and move the bomb. This is where our curiosity teaches us to be daring and to pick up the bomb and move it. This is going to become a key mechanic throughout this dungeon. So it's good that we can learn it here before moving on. Next we encounter the first real puzzle of the dungeon. There are four torches that need to be lit. Lighting these torches makes some stairs appear which will grant you access to the next area. This idea of lighting torches has already been ingrained in our heads prior to the dungeon when we first gained access to the lantern. But it's also an opportunity for the player to realise that lighting the torches can be undone. But at the moment we don't have an item to help us do that. Which again is a clue to the item that we're going to get in the dungeon. And in turn it also lets us know that we can reverse puzzles to gain access to secrets later on. The player is then rewarded with a chest containing the dungeon map. This is a common theme for solving puzzles in Zelda games. In the next room we encounter Ook and you are likely to think that he is the main dungeon boss. He is holding a boomerang which he uses to throw and cut the bridge ropes thus destroying the bridge. This turns out to be the item that you pick up later on and the way he is using it teaches you that you can throw the boomerang to cut things as well. This is useful information that you get prior to acquiring the item. This is another example of teaching by design that is used really well in this dungeon. Unfortunately, this is bookended by Midna jumping in to give you some information that you already had. Follow the monkeys to go further. Thanks, Midna. In the next room, you will find another bombling, which is another opportunity to show you how they work. Even if you're not brave enough to pick them up, it will naturally blow open the boulders next to it, signifying its usefulness within the dungeon. I really like how this next room is designed. You come across a hanging skull shooter that is tricky to overcome. If you take a moment to look around, you will find a way to get to higher ground and make it easier to take it down. This teaches you to think more strategically about the environment and how you can use it to your advantage. When we exit outside, we are shown that when the wind blows, these platforms will rotate, allowing you to cross. Immediately after, we are given a preview of a later room with another rotating platform, but seeing as we're inside, there is no wind to rotate it. 
is yet another example of how simple and elegant teaching by design can be. You now know how the platforms work and have an idea of a potential use for the dungeon item. Thumbs up. In the next room we're greeted by another caged monkey and we have to figure out how to free them. But if you're struggling you can talk to your monkey psychic who will show you what to do. This is a great way to make help an optional feature and it also teaches another key mechanic for this dungeon. It's also the main strategy for an upcoming boss, which I think is super clever. Here is an example of a gradual difficulty increase that really helps with the pacing of the dungeon. This is a Bubba Serpent that is a more aggressive and mobile version of a Deku Bubba. It comes just as the player is getting used to the dungeon and adds another layer of strategy to combat. More use of bomblings. More use of rolling into things. More lighting torches. More stairs, more spiders, and more monkeys. Yay! Now it's time for the encounter with Ook. This is a pretty easy boss fight where you use the rolling mechanic we learned earlier to unbalance him so the boomerang smacks him in the face. He falls off and you can go and slap his red ass. I almost feel bad for him. Ooh, a shiny boomerang. Okay, so this is the dungeon item. It's time to put it to good use and solve all of the puzzles we saw on our way here. It's really cool how we can use it in conjunction with other mechanics such as bomblings to blow up unreachable rocks. This is the final ingredient to a well-baked dungeon cake. Mmm, cake. We can now use the boomerang in interesting ways in combat, such as making skull chewers rear up, revealing their weak spots, or cutting down hanging Deku serpents. So, what was in this oh-so-enticing chest? Ooh, the compass. It may be everyone's least favourite item, but it does serve a purpose. Getting it so late into the dungeon will reveal any small chests or secret caves you may have missed. So it's cool that they didn't give it to you early and take all of the fun and pleasure out of exploring. It's at this point you will likely discover some of the chests hidden behind the stairs if you didn't spot them the first time. Also, having the boomerang makes taking on these annoying tile worms super easy by shooting them into the air onto their backs. They're cleverly placed close to the torches, so it's highly likely that you'll extinguish them with your boomerang. And upon doing this, the stairs will retreat back into the ground, revealing the chest hidden behind them. It's a really smart design choice that teaches you in a natural way. No one told you to do it, it just happened, and I love that. Here we have what may be the coolest puzzle in the dungeon. Four spinning locks need to be targeted in the correct order. Luckily, there is a path on the ground that shows you the solution. It's very simple, but super effective. Finally, we reach the real boss of the dungeon, Twilight Parasite Diabubba. This boss is a bit of a pushover at first. Two glorified giant Deku Bubbas attack one at a time, but are easily taken down with a convenient bombling by using your Gal Boomerang. After taking them out, our friendly neighborhood Ook swings in, holding bomblings from his feet, so we can use the same mechanic to defeat the main part of the boss. Occasionally, he will spew some purple goo at you, which you have to roll around and try and avoid. But this is really where the only challenge comes in. It's a very simple boss, but a fitting end to a very cool dungeon. And it uses a main mechanic that we picked up throughout the dungeon. There are two things that I really love about this dungeon. The first is how it teaches you by design in lots of cool and natural ways. You learn by playing, and you have fun whilst doing it. Secondly, it's how the dungeon we a story through it without even saying a word. Ook is taken over by the Twilight and he's turned into a bad guy so he locks up all of his monkey companions but when you beat him the Twilight is removed from him and he runs away but he comes back later on to help you during the final boss. This is a really cool way to show how the Twilight is enveloping everything and everyone in this game and by going through the dungeons and defeating the boss you are slowly eradicating it and making things good again. So I really hope you enjoyed this dungeon analysis. I had a lot of fun making it. I'd really like to hear your thoughts on the dungeon design and which are your favourite parts about it. I hope you can join me next time when I talk about the fire dungeon in The Legend of Zelda Twilight Princess. So thanks for watching and I will see you on the next one. Bye!